great. Well, thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you, Caroline and Sean, for coming. Yeah. Um, I understand that everybody picked up chocolate samples on their way in, so I wanted to start with a simple question. How should we eat chocolate? Um, at Boja Chocolat, we believe that there is a certain way to eat chocolate, and the main premise of the way we try to instruct people to eat chocolate is to be present in the moment. And on the back of our large size candy bars, I think you guys got the little guys today, we actually have the instructions, starting with, you know, stop, take a moment, look at it, notice the glossy shine on the chocolate, rub it, smell it, break it, hear the snap, which teaches you about the temper of the chocolate before you put it in your mouth, let it melt, and again, go through the whole sensory experience. And I've been so used to, I've worked with Vosch for over 13 years now, and when I bring truffles somewhere and someone's talking and I see them pop down a truffle and swallow it, and I'm like, no, stop. You know, that's a very good truffle. Uh, so I think that the key for us, um, whether you follow the exact steps or not, is to make sure that you engage and you slow down and that you really pay attention to the moment when you're eating the chocolate. Any tips, Sean? Um, we really think that chocolate should be approachable. And by that, um, we don't have a lot of instructions for it. I think it's important for people to be mindful uh, in the way that Katrina would recommend, and we certainly agree with that. But we don't want chocolate to be something that people um, feel is inaccessible. And by mindful, though, I would like for people to think about where it came from and what uh, care and difficulty and struggles um, were endured to bring it um, to the person who's consuming it. But um, I think if people would um, maybe smell the food or chocolate before chomping it down, um, that's a good idea because taste is 90% smell. And we, we think that that's a good way to try our chocolate. All right, so think about that while you're while you're nibbling on your chocolates. So um, just to get to know you both a little bit, I want to ask, how did you get into this business in the first place? And actually, Sean, why don't we start with you? OK. I was a criminal defense lawyer for 20 years. And, <laughs> and, uh, and that's the truth. And um, anyway, I specialized in murder and uh, very high-grade felony cases. And I loved it. I loved the work. I loved the courtroom. And there came a time when I didn't love it. And um, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have any hobbies. All I knew how to do was cross-examine people, and, uh, which my wife can attest to. And, um, and by the way, my daughter is here. She's our sales and marketing director, Lauren Askinosi, and she, she can attest to that as well. But, um, so what I did is I started getting some hobbies. And the first hobby was grilling. And I bought a big green egg. And I started making um, you know, chicken and turkeys and stuff. And that led to baking. And I've made thousands of cupcakes. And I loved, and still do, love cupcakes. And then I started making chocolate desserts. And all the while, I had a very simple prayer um, for five years. And it was this, God, please give me something else to do. And I, and I did. And I, I said that for five years. And then um, I was just driving one day to a funeral of a distant relative. And, in the car, and the idea just kind of came to me to make chocolate from scratch, and I had no idea that it came from a bean. No idea. I thought it just showed up on the store shelf. I, I had no idea. But within a few months of that, I was in the Amazon. And uh, I knew then, after working with farmers there, that I wanted to do this thing, and so I started transitioning my law practice and buying equipment in a factory, and my last jury trial was six years ago last month. And that's Did you it. know what you were getting into? No. <laughs> had no idea. It was, uh, you know, as a lawyer, the only piece of equipment I ever had to really worry about was the copier. And if, you know, I would maybe get, take out a paper jam or something like that. And now I have to worry about equipment from all over the world that um, some, of, some of which is very old. Um, and so, um, no, I, I had no idea. And making chocolate at home... On, and you know, double boiling the, the chocolate and tempering the chocolate on a granite slab, that's one thing. And I thought, oh, you know, we, we can do this. But then when you scale it up to several hundred pounds at a time, it's a whole different ballgame. Caroline, how did you get into this? 
Um, well, we'll watch a video about how the owner, Katrina, got into it, so I'll tell the story about how I found my way to her. About 13 years ago, I moved to Chicago, and one of my friends was working at the Vosges Chocolat store. It was quite a small company at that time. And she said, well, you should work there just one day a week to meet friends and get to know Chicago. And they happened to be opening a shop at the Peninsula Hotel. So the day the Peninsula shop opened, I showed up at 7 a.m. on my first day living in Chicago. And I was familiar with the brand because I was a fan. And some hours into it, Katrina showed up and said, oh, hi, you are new. And yes, we met each other. And just then, a lawyer who was staying at the hotel walked into the shop. And we got talking to him about the brand. And because I was such a fan, I knew about the chocolates. And I started talking to him, and you should buy corporate gifts. And Katrina's looking at me like, who is this <laughs> new employee who just started today? And I love to get people going and get chatting with them. So by the time he walked out, he had bought $1,300 worth of chocolate. <laughs> and That's Katrina, a lawyer for you. Yeah, Katrina, <laughs> yeah, well, he was, I think he was enjoying the conversation with two young ladies. And <laughs> he let himself get carried away. And she looked at me when he walked out and said, who are you? I said, I'm a really big fan. <laughs> so we found our way to working together. And um, I worked in the store a little bit more. A few months later, she had offered me a full-time job. And it's the same time I had the offer to work at a architecture engineering firm doing marketing, and I remember saying to my parents, well, here's my choices. There's this big, huge high-rise downtown. I could work on the 23rd floor, and I'd be the international marketing coordinator for this architecture firm. Or there's this girl making really cool chocolate, and she has this office that has a garage door that opens it, because it's an old <laughs> you know, warehouse space. And my parents were looking at me, like, is there a choice here? But uh, I really felt in my gut she was doing something different and interesting, and she's an extremely magnetic person. She's an innovator. She was so, I could see that she had big, huge dreams. So uh, I made the choice to work with <laughs> Katrina in the garage door <laughs> office back when there were only about seven employees. And since then, I've grown with her. I did a little stint um, running the operations. It was another Katrina moment where she said so innocently, you seem really smart, and we need to know how much inventory we have. So maybe you could figure that out. And so I just sort of you know, rode the roller coaster with her through the years of helping run the operations, helping open new stores, do sales, and um, it's been quite an amazing ride. And it's been really fun to watch people react to her brand. It's such a blessing. It's an emotional brand. It's one that moves people. And she really uses chocolate to do big things. And it's been fun to be a part of that. Well, I want to get into sort of this emergence of you know, fine American artisanal chocolates. This is, some, this is a market that we've really seen grow in the last several years. Both of you have, uh, you know, work with brands uh, that are selling chocolate bars for $8 a bar, which is on the pricey end. Um, and yet, and yet this, this is fl a flourishing time for you. How is it that that's been growing during this time of economic recession when people have been tightening their purse strings? What explains that? John, why don't you start? Eight dollars for a chocolate bar is a great value. <laughs> and someday, someday the chocolate bars will sell for twenty dollars and it'll be a great value and here's why. Where else can you go and get the best of something for eight dollars? You can't get the best wine for $8. You can't get the best olive oil for $8. There, there, you, you can't get the best hunk of cheese for $8. And so I think we sort of take that for granted, and we think that because we grew up on a $1.99 chocolate bar, that that's the same as what Katrina makes or what I make or what other colleagues of mine make in America uh, or Europe, for that matter. And Here's why it's a value. I go to all these farms myself every year. I go to Honduras, Ecuador, Tanzania, Philippines. I've been to all those places just in the last four months. I go work with the farmers directly. I pay them directly. I open my books to them. I translate our financial statements into the language they need, and then I share profits with them. And then I work in their communities to build goodwill and do projects for them and work as partners with them. And so I make a profit thankfully, even in this economy. It's a small profit, though. And the chocolate that we make, that all of us make, is really a great value when you think about all that went in to bringing it here and making it. And so why do I think that it would be a great value at $20? Because farmers would make more money. And we've been repressing the price of cocoa beans 
since Columbus found them in Honduras, whenever that was, and it's, we need to raise the prices for farmers so that they can have the standard of living that they need so they have access to the things that they want, medical care and education for their families. Well, I'm interested in knowing, you know, how is it that the consumers have um, sort of made this, this shift in thinking it might be, or maybe it's a different kind of consumer. Um, you know, what is it that is propelling people to consider and purchase, you know, more expensive chocolates at a time that, you know, people um, across the country have been going through economic hardship? Caroline, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think that it is, like he said, I think that it's the best. You're getting the best for something, and I would almost go to the, um, say it's an affordable luxury. And there is a real emotional connection to chocolate. Almost everybody knows that if they like chocolate, it makes you feel good. There's some science behind that. And I think that in a time when it's economically hard, there are a lot of luxuries that people are foregoing. You know, but if there is a moment with a chocolate bar that you can share it with people, you can have it alone, uh, it makes you feel a certain way, and it stimulates all your senses that I think that people are willing to forego some larger luxuries maybe in, in exchange for a more affordable one. And speaking specifically of the Voja Chocolat products, Katrina sources from around the world a lot of the ingredients she puts in it. And um, for instance, our white cocoa, the Bianca, has Australian lemon myrtle and also lavender from France. And when I was doing the operations, I was talking to this guy in Australia who was very hard to get a hold of, who was harvesting our lemon myrtle, and it had come this little bag like this. And it was just you know, this little gem of spice that smelled amazing that we'd make into the white cocoa with high-level white cocoa. And part of the benefit of being young when she started the business and when I was working with her is that we didn't know things about find out what you think the market will pay. We didn't even know, so we didn't pay attention. And so when people would, we'd figure out how much it cost us and how much we had to sell it for. And if anyone came in and said, geez, cow, you're really gonna think people are gonna pay for that? And Katrina would say, well, that's what it costs to make this bar or to make this cocoa. And we'll just explain that to people. And over the past years, I guess you know, a lot of people are into more traceability and I think internet and access has got more educated consumers. Uh, but they seemed to pay attention and listen to us about, you know, same with Sean, why it costs so much and their understanding. And then they take advantage of the affordable luxury. Yeah, I mean, I want to get into this sort of idea of chocolate becoming sort of an emotional, maybe even an educational experience for customers. And, and I wonder if that, you know, in part helps to explain why people are, why this, why this is a growing sector of the market. Um, can you, I mean, can you both sort of tell me a little bit when you talk about the story behind the chocolate or the experience, what do you mean? Well, for us, we, we sell our chocolate. Um, we're, we're a very small family business. There's 13 full-time employees and we use no distributors in the United States. So all of the relationship, relationships that we have are direct to store. So we're, we're in about 500 stores around the country and my daughter Lauren handles sales for us. So that means that she's talking to these people. And uh, like, for instance, um, Tracy with Providence Food and Wine, where we sell our chocolate here in Chicago, among some other stores, she's outside today and, and selling our chocolate for us. She knows our story. She knows that this isn't just an 85-gram chocolate bar. She knows the story of how we make the chocolate. She knows the story of how I go and source these cocoa beans from the farmers directly. And she wants to tell that story to her customers. Now, you multiply that times 500, and plus we sell a lot of chocolate in Europe, um, then you, you get this sense that people want to know, they want to be informed, they want to be educated, and we know that this is not just happening in chocolate. It's happening across the entire food spectrum, despite what's happening in our economy. Why? Because this started growing decades ago when people started going to farmers markets around this country. What, the reason people want to go to farmers markets is because they want to know about the food they're putting in their mouths and what they're consuming. And the reason that they like the farmers market is because you can go directly to the person who's growing it and say, hey, how did you, how did you grow this? Did you use any pesticides and chemicals? You know, what, um, tell me about your farm. Tell me about your family. Well, we can't do that with chocolate, but it's the next best thing because I have the name of every single farmer I can trace our chocolate to every farmer in every country where I buy beans. And the main reason I do that is because I profit share with them. And you can't profit share with people that you don't know. So this 
value proposition for not just um, chocolate, but all foods, we're seeing the prices go up, but we're seeing greater consumption, and I think it has to do with because people are recognizing the value, and it's not just about the taste of the product. It's about the story behind it. It's, it as I have been saying, it's, it's how it all came together, and people are finding an interest in that, even if they can't buy as much of it. They appreciate the value of it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to do my Paul Ryan impression. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline, um, I want to ask you about this too because uh, we, you know, we spoke on the phone before this event and uh, you told me how much time you spent crafting the actual like narrative mm -hmm. behind each of these chocolate products. Can you tell me a little bit about what kind of narrative does it take to sell chocolate and, yeah. and why was so much care put into that? Sure. Um, Katrina was not always a chocolate lover. She actually, she had a chocolate moment where she understood, she had a wonderful chocolate moment in Paris once, and when she was looking about how to express herself with her culinary skills, she had a necklace on that she was wearing that she'd bought from the Nagaland tribe in India. And she had studied at Le Cordon Bleu, and then she went to El Boli and studied under Ferran Adria, and then he encouraged her to travel the world and learn more about food from unexpected places. So her epiphany moment was one night when she thought, boy, the chocolate industry is somewhat boring. There's a lot of raspberry creams and less interesting flavors. And inspired by this necklace she was wearing from the Nagaland tribe in India, she said, well, what if we put curry in it? What if I taught people about this tribe through chocolate? So she put curry and coconut in a truffle, and she brought it to her job the next day and saw everybody say, huh, you know, curry and chocolate? And she said, but you have to know about these people, and actually the flavors really work. And she told them about the Nagaland trip that she'd taken, and they tried it. And she immediately just steamrolled, started talking about Japan with her wasabi ginger black sesame seed. And she knew a, f a chef in Budapest that she had been very taken by, so she did a Hungarian paprika. And that's how the Travel the World Through Chocolate concept was born, which was her first traditional purple box that um, is our core product. Beyond that, what she started to understand about herself is that chocolate was her medium for expressing herself, really more as an artist. So we've had, I'll, I'll give an example of another, we have a groove collection. And if you look on the website at all the different types of chocolates there, there's something she falls in love with or is interested in, whether it's fermentation of cheese or in the case of the groove collection, she was interested in the influence of African American music on American music. And, and so she studied everything from slave chants through rural blues, and as she studied the history of African American influence on music, to her, <laughs> very special person that she is, it comes into her mind in the form of chocolate. So we have a collection called the Groove Collection that has truffles that bring you through the history of African American influence on music. There's a rural blues and the Anson Mills grits that are in that. And then there's a bacon truffle and it goes up through hip hop which has a champagne and gold leaf on top of a white chocolate truffle. And it comes with a CD. So she creates the experience because her chocolate is, she's an artist using chocolate as her medium for storytelling. So what I was explaining earlier to Odette is that crafting the insert cards and the booklets and the information that comes with all of her collections, all of her inspiration is lost without those things. So she really wants people, she always says, I don't just sell chocolate, I sell a chocolate experience. And that is why we make sure people understand her inspiration behind it and offer the education. So she's hoping to open their minds to new ideas and to create a less judgmental world through the chocolate. Uh, we actually have a four-minute video um, that looks at Katrina and Vosges, which we should watch. Food's always been an important part of her life, but not necessarily chocolate, until one night after a Cordon Bleu class in Paris. That evening, I went home and I made my first truffle, and I decided chocolate was the medium. And if the medium is the message, her newfound passion translates into millions of truffles and one heck of a culinary adventure. Gosh, I get inspiration from so many things, mostly travel and meeting people from other cultures, going to regional places and eating street food. Well, I have a very big mission, um, sort of to bring peace to the world through chocolate, which is a big idea, but Really, it started out just getting people to open their minds up to new ideas and sort of less judgment on 
oh, that sounds terrible, instead of being like open to like trying something like with curry. We use chocolate very much as a medium to explore other cultures and tell stories and ingredients. What we're really known for, I think, is the exotic. I think chocolate is the most powerful word in the food dictionary, as I say. And when you say the word chocolate to someone, they just sort of gasp for, oh my gosh, oh yes, chocolate, I'll try it. And then you say, oh, well, there's oyster in it, or there's curry. They, you know, have a little trepidation to, to actually put it to their mouth, but because it's chocolate, they're sort of open to trying it. And I say that because I, I say chocolate can open people's minds to new ideas is because with our chocolate we do very exotic, interesting storytelling and flavor profiles with chocolate and I think once someone has something that they never thought they would like, that they never thought they would try like curry and chocolate and they have it and they have this great experience, in some way I think that they are changed and, and they are more open to trying other flavors whether it be wasabi or curry or olive oil or maybe they're more open to other things in their life, to, to people or conversations or ideas. I just kind of grew it organically out of my house, but I always knew it was going to be big and significant. I always knew, like I had a really strong vision for the brand, and it's all about pleasure and experience and surprise. When it comes to gourmet chocolatiers, Vogue is leading the way in sustainability, showing that it's possible to use most organic ingredients while maintaining control over the whole supply chain. So I started something called the Green Purchasing Oath, where we would measure our green impact by what we bought. So our goal is 90% of what we buy needs to be either post-consumer recycled material, biodegradable, or organic. The project that we're doing in Belize is really, really cool because it's a sustainable agricultural eco-lodge. So it has a lot going on. What we're doing there is planting heritage varietals of cacao, criollo, and trinitario, about 3,000 acres. And then we're making bean to bar chocolate down there. We are calling it root to bar because we're actually planting the cacao, which is very rare and unusual that you get the chance to have your own land to plant cacao in. If you get a chance to come down, it's going to be amazing. You can learn how to make chocolate, coffee, vanilla, spirits. You can learn about sustainable agriculture. And it's, it's really exciting for me because it's really going the full vertical for us from planting to making chocolate. Wild Ophelia is basically an American road trip through chocolate. We really wanted to bridge the local farmers movement in the states with chocolate and really focus on traceability of ingredients and craft process with some of the best, most esteemed farmers and food artisans in the country. So I felt like someone needed to connect the dots with chocolate, sort of a bridge between the local farmers movement and chocolate. When I first started Vosges, you know, I was working all the time and so I didn't have a lot of time for doing like charity work. I found um, when I was in Paris actually getting my hair cut, <laughs> I was reading a magazine and it, there, there was an, a story about a woman from Afghanistan and her face was completely marred and her skin and as I read the story, I guess she showed too much arm skin and so her husband decided to punish her by throwing acid all over her. And that really hit me very deeply and when I got back to the States I was like, I want to figure out how to help sort of women in, in this situation and I found V-Day, which is anti-violence against women and girls worldwide and they support grassroots organizations all over the world and so I called them I said, you know, I'm just starting out but I'd really love to help contribute, you know, to your cause in some way and so we started with them 14 years ago and right when I started. It's a way for us to sort of share those stories of what V-Day is doing and also get back uh, proceeds to V-Day. We also do some cool things for children's charities. There's a really one cool one called Little Kids Rock. It's all about supporting music education for children, which is something that keeps getting cut and cut. And creativity is something that I'm really, really interested in, in, in fostering and in innovation. And at a young age, at an old age, at any age, it's really important because innovation and creativity is just what's made this brand unique. It's a big part of our culture. And that's also why I'm, I'm really excited about building this new chocolate temple experience that we're doing, where it'll be tourable, but it's really all about creativity and innovation and inspiration. All these steps that I go through in creating chocolate, and hopefully that will inspire people 
just to think about things in a different way. So We're building a chocolate temple too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there was, you know, there's a lot that was in that, uh, just touching on so many themes. Um, but I want to talk about the social justice sort of, uh, you know, approach that you, Sean, have taken, and, and clearly that Katrina's taking to chocolate as well. Um, what's with that? <laughs> well, I came from a world of social justice. I mean, as a as a criminal defense lawyer, it was part of what I did for the last, you know, 25 years. And so I wanted to incorporate that into the business. So it, from the very beginning, the first day we opened, we, we created a program called Chocolate University. And we're in a neighborhood in Springfield, Missouri that is undergoing revitalization, but we're one block from our largest homeless shelter. There's 80 kids a night in that shelter. And so what I wanted to do is find a way to involve the neighborhood kids in our business, to teach them about social entrepreneurship and teach them how we treat farmers and what we do around the world. So we have an elementary school program, a middle school program, and a high school program. And the high school program is applicants from around our city apply to be a part of this, and they spend one week on the Drury University College campus before our trip, and then I take them with me to Tanzania to meet uh, the cocoa farmer, Mama Kieja, a woman-led cocoa farmer uh, group, to meet the farmers, to uh, help me grade the cocoa beans, and then to do a project with our Chocolate University School there um, in Tanzania, Moya Secondary School. And so we do this because I firmly believe that if we can expose young people to the developing world, even in short-term trips, that we can change the world. And so I'm finding that um, this has just been a great um, experience for me and for the kids. We take about 20 in our group when we go. I raise the money from doing tours at our factory. All of the tour money that we get goes to our Chocolate University Fund. And then there are donors from around the country who help me fund getting these kids over there. Um, we also have a nutrition program. So this high school where we work in Tanzania, out in the middle of nowhere, eat, these kids eat one meal a day. Literally one meal a day, all of them, 1,100 of them in this high school. And so what we did is we started this nutrition program, and I'm, I'm as, as excited about this as I am anything in our business. And it works like this, and we, we did it first in the Philippines. When I was in the Philippines la uh, two times ago, I asked the principal what she needed at our Chocolate University school there, uh, Malagos Elementary. And she said that 100, 100 of the kids are on the malnourished watch list. So I said, let's address this problem before we get computers and do that kind of thing. And so the PTA of this little school made a product called Tablia. It's a hot chocolate drink. I bought 800 units of that from a, for a dollar a piece, then I sold them for 10, and the $9 funds lunch for every single kid in that elementary school all year long. And I did that by only buying 800 units. And what's beautiful about this and why I'm so excited about it is because no government grant, no donations, all run self-sustaining. Why? Because the PTA, they're, they're active. They have a, a stake in the nutritional outcome of these kids' future. And so it's funny. I'm trying to do the same thing in my hometown. It's taken me longer to do it at a school two blocks from me than it did 10,000 miles away in the Philippines because there's more red tape at home. But we're going to do it, and then we're doing it now in Tanzania. Right now, there's a container headed my way with 1,000 kilos of rice. It's the most beautiful gourmet rice you've ever had from these PTA members at, in Tanzania. And I'm going to sell those bags of rice, and starting in February, every single one of those 1,100 kids that now only gets one meal a day, they're going to get lunch because I'm going to sell those bags of rice, and the money will then go back monthly to the PTA. And so we're a really small business, and my message is, through chocolate, that small businesses can do something. They can make a difference, even if it's just a really, really small way. And so all of this social justice aspect is incorporated into the chocolate. It's not like we have a department at our factory or a person who just works on this. We all work on it. And we want to teach these kids um, how we do business and that there's a world out there beyond Springfield, Missouri. And we also incorporate um, how we profit share with farmers. It's very important for me to the farmers, for the farmers to see our books. I've practiced open book management since I was a lawyer. Everybody in my office knew what the revenues and expenses were, and we all participated in the outcome. And we do the same thing at our factory. I teach financial literacy to everybody in our factory. Every other week, we have a, a long finance meeting. 
everybody knows where we are. And that has been important to me. Um, and I wouldn't do chocolate, I don't think, without these aspects of our business. I want to turn the question. Thank you. Thank you. I want to turn the question on the other end and now ask, I mean, to what extent is somebody's purchase of one kind of chocolate over another an affirmation of a political statement? I mean, we're looking at chocolates now that are fair trade, that are organic, um, you know, there's a story behind each of these chocolates now. I mean, to what extent has this, what used to be sort of just sort of a generic purchase, become an affirmation of one's political worldview? And Caroline, why don't we start with you? Um, I would say that more and more, there are just more educated consumers. When I was growing up, you just went to the drugstore and you bought a candy bar and that was your candy bar. <laughs> you know, you didn't think any more about it. And I think in general, with the whole foodie movement and um, people are just more educated consumers, and we have noticed at Boja Chocolat over the years that there are a lot more people calling our chocolate concierge team and saying, you know, where does your chocolate come from? Is it, you know, is it responsible? And wanting to ask that, and we welcome that. You know, it's wonderful to have an educated consumer. As far as is that driving the sale, I would say with Sean's business especially, he, his efforts are so amazing and founded on his work with the cacao farms. A lot of Katrina's work uh, is a lot of storytelling and introducing people to other parts of the world. And I think that that may drive their purchase sometimes. If you're at Whole Foods and you see the chocolate bars at the checkout, they're probably driven by the crazy flavors, you know, because that's what you're seeing. But there are times in our catalog and on our website that we sell more of the things that donate to V-Day, for instance. If someone is saying, I'm gonna give corporate gifts, and it's really important to me to make sure that I'm being socially responsible with my gift giving, and then we help them choose the items that we have that that do both, that will tell a story, that will create an amazing chocolate experience, and that also will help with some social responsibility. Well, <clears throat> Intelligentsia is one of our biggest customers uh, in the country. And they are the daddy of the direct trade movement. They have pioneered direct trade for all of us, I believe. Because when I started my business, I used their model of direct trade in how to interact with farmers. And when I needed help with a, you know, how to talk to somebody about a particular provision of a contract or something, I sought out Intelligentsia. And so they're a, a great company who have sort of paved the way for the consuming public to understand why direct trade is important. So for, for us in chocolate, we're um, hopefully um, riding that wave that has been paved by other people like Intelligentsia and other people in the coffee movement because I think there's a lot of similarities in how we source and how we sell. And so then that translates down to someone like Tracy from Provenance Food and Wine or, or other stores here. They get that. And then when a customer comes in, they may buy that bar because Tracy was able to communicate that story to them. Now, I, I say this, we say this in our factory. It's not about the chocolate, it's about the chocolate. Now, I didn't make that up, but here, here's what I mean. It's kind of zen, but anyway. What I'm, what I'm saying is, in, I can't think that this is all about the chocolate and all I care about is the chocolate because I want to do these other things, these other, these other things that tell the story and that, that give me this opportunity to do these things around the world. And so if we made chocolate that tasted like cardboard, then I couldn't do all these other things around the world. But if all I focused on were these, was, were these things around the world, then we wouldn't have an award-winning product. So that's why it's gotta be about both. And I think the consuming public, they care. As long as it tastes great and they have a great experience, and then they have an understanding of the story, they're gonna keep coming back. And they're gonna keep coming back despite the economic hardships that we see. I'm very mindful of that. I think about what's happening in our economy and how it not only, not, not only affects my business, but my, my community. I think about it all the time. And so I think being mindful of that and how we can help our brothers and sisters that are going through tough times, um, it just propels all of us um, forward, I think. I, I want to know, where do your brands um, fit in with sort of the global world of chocolate? I think traditionally, when people have thought of fine chocolates, 
they've looked to Europe and maybe particularly to Switzerland. Um, I mean, when I've spoken with both of you independently, you, you both use words like innovation and pushing the envelope and things like that. And I'd like to know, are those new concepts that are coming up from people like yourselves, you know, who are working in this sort of artisanal, small chocolate world in America? Or is this something that's happening all over? I mean, where do we fit? Where does this American sort of niche market of producing and, and, cr and crafting fine chocolates fit in this traditional sort of hierarchy, if you will? Um, well, I, when I first started with Katrina about 13 years ago, um, my husband's from Europe, so we go off into the Netherlands and have been to Belgium a lot, and so you go in the shops in Belgium and there's beautiful windows full of chocolate and it's very traditional chocolate. And I didn't see anything unusual, caramels and you know your usual dark chocolates, light chocolates. And um, when I've been back recently, and over the past 10 years, I hadn't heard of many people putting curry in chocolate until Katrina did, and I think she's often credited as being sort of a founder of that movement. Now you go back and there's wasabi and curry in almost every single window <laughs> in Belgium. And so I felt really proud. I was like, yeah, well, we've been doing that you know, for years. <laughs> Uh, I think that there's always going to be a, a lot of the chocolate processing happens in Europe, um, people who aren't doing it themselves like Sean is, so I think they still are a huge power of chocolate processing, but I think Americans are an entrepreneurial people and an innovative people, and when someone starts something, and a lot of, I've met a lot of small um, chocolate makers, and as Sean is and as Katrina is, I find them to be a passionate sort. <laughs> I don't know if it's the emotional thing that chocolate does to people, um, but they're innovative and they're passionate and they're hands-on and they want to do something with the world and they see something bigger. It's rarely about the chocolate. I can't speak entirely for the you know rest of the world's chocolate industry, but I have a vision in my head of these chocolate shops in Bruges, you know, and how they look. And then I have a vision of, this, of the American market I've been exposed to, which is these people that just want to do something, and they have big visions and big dreams, and they're changing. And again, I think it's the lifeblood of Americans. We're an innovative, entrepreneurial people. And where you see opportunity or change or you want to make change, um, I think we do it. So I don't know as far as the leader of masses of chocolate in production would go, but the innovation that I see in small chocolate in this country I think is outstanding and, and unique. Well, we just made a bar. We started this project called Collaboration, and I misspell collaborate, collab bar eight, and because um, I'm trying to be funny. But um, the um, one of our we've won a huge award in London two weeks ago for a dark milk chocolate bar with licorice. The licorice is from Sweden. I wouldn't have thought about putting licorice in chocolate, but for the work of Katrina, I wouldn't. I would have never thought about that. And so she has pioneered this innovation so that people can experiment with different flavors and not you know, judge that, oh, that's my wife. For example, my wife hates licorice, but this is her favorite bar that we make. Um, as far as Europe goes, our biggest customer in the world, including any customer in the United States, is our distributor in Sweden. I said we don't use distributors. We don't use them domestically. We do internationally. Our distributor in Sweden buys more than any single customer in the US and has for several years. We just sent our first pallet order to Switzerland last month. I'm like, hey, okay, we'll take it. You know, we'll take it. So I think it's happening. And I think people around the world are respecting the work of American chocolate makers. And, and I think that's just going to continue. I mean, I imagine that you've both been at chocolate conferences and things like that and spoken with people from all over the world who are in this industry. I mean, what do they say about what's coming out of the U.S.? I think it depends on who you, for instance, um, I think the people in France are somewhat um, resistant to the idea that American chocolate makers are invading their way into Paris or uh, wherever. Um, but there's, there's this sort of um, reluctant acceptance of the fact that there's some Americans who are doing really great things with chocolate and flavor and um, it's happening. Yeah, we've seen the same thing that uh, I went to the, about 10 years ago, I went to the Aspen Food and Wine Festival with Katrina, and she's in her mid-20s, and I think Pierre Hermé was there. I was so honored to meet this, you know, giants of, of French pastry. 
And she had a very nice, friendly relationship with them. But I think when we were younger, I felt a lot of people looking at her like, oh, isn't that sweet, this girl trying these crazy things with chocolate? But over the past decade, it's just you can't deny the growth and the consumers are doing the talking by their interest. And so I think that maybe it went from like, oh, isn't that cute, these Americans trying and playing around with chocolate, um, to as he said, it, it's just a, a power that is real now. Um, so, I mean, so that's looking at how, you know, the U.S. is changing sort of the global discussion on chocolate. How, how has what, you know, how have your brands changed, or how has this emerging market in the U.S. changed sort of the big Hershey's and the Mars and the sort of industrial chocolate makers that everyone sort of would have associated with well, the U.S.? Um, in 2005, Hershey bought Scharfenberger, who were the pioneers in bean-to-bar chocolate starting in 1995 for $47 million, um, uh, seven times sales. Um, and now Scharfenberger is pretty much, I mean, they, they had a beautiful factory in San Francisco and it's gone now. They've usurped sort of all of the production into Hershey. Um, I, you know, it's still good chocolate, but it, it to me is more uh, of a commodity brand of chocolate unfortunately, um, and we see the big, big industrial chocolate makers sort of tiptoeing, besides that sort of anomaly of Scharfenberger, into this world of uh, premium chocolate. But remember, the chocolate market in America is a $20 billion industry. Where, where we are, or particularly us, we're in a very, very sub, sub, sub sector of that industry, making you know, bean-to-bar chocolate bars um, and so I don't see them really trying to push in that space because that's not, for them, it's not volume driven. For example, we produce about 25 metric tons of chocolate a year with 13 people. That's about 25 metric tons of cocoa beans that I acquire. The Mars Hershey plant in this city that makes the Snickers bars does that in a shift. <laughs> okay? Now, on the other side of that, um, there is a... a, a I talked to the people at Mars, and um, one, my mentor is, works at Mars and ha has helped me over the years with technical problems, with bean problems, and uh, has been a great friend to me. And I've also had the chance to see the work that Mars is doing around the world with cocoa farmers, and it's good. And I respect the work that they're doing. And given the size company that they are and the decisions that they've made, I, I admire that. Caroline, I mean, do you have any thoughts on whether this premium chocolate market is starting to change the, the, the bigger market here? Yeah, I, over the years I've talked a couple different times where we've met people who used to work somewhere and we find that our products are living in all their R&D departments. <laughs> you know, they're, they buy up the small growing companies and, and get inspired and ideas from them. And there were times early on when there were direct copycats and you know, a bigger bar company, Target, came out with their own line, and we'd see similar, I do a lot of writing for Katrina and Vosges, and there were times where there was this how to eat a candy bar thing, and I, I got so mad, I said, I wrote that. I mean, that's pretty much what I wrote. <laughs> and she has a great uh, outlook. She says, eyes forward, you know, we're doing what we're doing. I'm innovating what I'm doing. I have ideas. I, she could, she's one of those people that could come up with ideas, you know, nonstop, and so, she said, don't worry about that. This is what we're doing, you know, eyes forward. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. So we see it, and, and I think that all the brands that are coming up putting the exotic spices in, trying to talk about chocolate in an experiential way, the way that we do. So there are copycats out there, uh, but I think it, in, in some way maybe it makes it better. If they're gonna, he's got amazing values in his company. Katrina has great values in what she's doing. So if that's gonna rub off on the bigger industry, great. We've got about 15 minutes and we want to open it up to questions from the audience. We have two microphones, so if you have a question, please come up to one of the microphones. Um, oh, come on. Yeah. Okay. Looks like we've got some folks Tell coming. For it. <laughs> Hi. I was in um, Liverpool uh, recently and they have a museum of slavery, because I guess the slave trade was very significant in Liverpool. And I passed a, an exhibit where there was a guy talking, I think he was an African, and he was making a statement which may have been hyperbole, and I kind of like your opinion on it. He, he, he said that 
it would be impossible. Well, he was trying to make the point that there's still slavery going on in the world today, even though we think of it as a you know, mm. past phenomenon. And he made the statement that we wouldn't be able to have chocolate if it weren't for the existence of slavery. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, from what you know, is that, was that just really hyperbole, or is that true in some places? Or you know, what, what do you know about that? Um, it is not hyperbole, but it depends on the kind of chocolate that you're talking about. So 50% of the world's supply of chocolate comes from Ghana and Ivory Coast, 50% even though that's not where it started. I mean, South America, Central South America is where it all started, but now, you know, it's, it's really in West Africa. So if you have chocolate where the beans were sourced from Ghana and Ivory Coast, then I would say that there's some truth to that statement. There is not truth to that statement, though, that it's impossible to make chocolate today that would be slave-free. None of the farmers that I work with have or support any kind of slave labor or child slave labor, and it's critically important to me. And one of the reasons that I personally go to all of these places all of the time and travel a lot, um, and so we don't find, that we really are not finding slave labor problems in the chocolate industry except in those places in West Africa. So for instance, in East Africa where I am in Tanzania, it is not a problem. It's not a problem in Ecuador or Honduras where I go, and, uh, or the Philippines, it's just not. But it is a problem that the industrial chocolate makers have to contend with, must contend with, and the consuming public, we have to be mindful and watchful and keep them accountable so that, that this stops. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not exactly asking for political endorsement one way or another, but um, what does it feel like to be quote unquote, job creator entrepreneurs in, with a social conscience in this uh, sort of politically polarized discourse that we've had lately. It seems like you would be vilified from both sides or something. I mean, it's a, such a, um, you know, such a polarized rhetoric environment these days. Yeah. Since I'm not the business owner directly, I can't speak to it quite as well. Um, so maybe Sean wants to take that. Well, one. okay. Uh, did everybody hear his question? about how is it to be a, an entrepreneur or business owner in this politically polarized world that we live in now, and given what's happening and the, the, the level of debate in this country over how to fix the economy. Let me just say this. Uh, I, I, uh, I actually wish we had some other choices, um, because I'm disappointed in the fact that um, more people don't have jobs than they do. And as an entrepreneur, what I want to do is hire people. I want to grow to a certain level. I mean, we want to remain a small business. But where I believe that this, much of this can be solved is by helping each other. And so what that means is that I need to be thinking of ways that I can serve the people that I know that are hurting from this economy. And I encourage um, my fellow business people and the people that I know and my friends to be the same way. Because we're not going to get out of this problem. We are not going to be the country that we once were until we start helping each other, for, regardless of parties, regardless of the Tea Party, regardless of the Occupy Wall Street movement, and we start individualizing it to our neighbors and our friends and helping each other. And until we do that, it's not going to get fixed. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. It's our responsibility. It's Odette's. It's, it's all of our responsibility, everybody here, to take some accountability for that. And so, as a business owner, I'm doing what I can in my small way to, to do that and to operate in that environment. So, um, without saying who I'm going to vote for, I mean, that's <laughs> kind of where I stand. I'm short. My question's actually about your chocolate. I was wondering if you change your recipe at all when you um, have domestic and your European chocolate to follow the different international regulations they have on cocoa percentages and everything. 
Um, I can, Katrina specifies different, she doesn't go direct, well we're, as you saw in the video now, there will be this farm in Belize and she's able to curate the different beans that she's growing there. Um, she uses very high cacao percentages and even our milk chocolate is a deep milk chocolate, so that's a higher percentage of cacao. And our white chocolate is a pure cocoa butter white chocolate. So when you have a quality chocolate, the percentages are usually quite a bit higher. She does change the recipes uh, and the chocolate percentages in the recipes depending on what she's making. There are some like the Tanzanian chocolate that might be you know, more tannic and better with certain things. So the chocolate she uses and combines actually is very specific to each of her recipes. And uh, because it's a quality chocolate that she's always using, it, it isn't in violation of any sorts of regulations. We don't. We don't change the recipe for what we sell. We're, we don't have the capability to, like if it's going to China, to make a different product. I mean, and we do or did sell in China. I'm not sure we'll be doing it again, but um, that's a long story. But, the, um, but we don't have the, the ability. I mean, we do things with packaging to accommodate the government regulations and requirements in whatever um, export country we're going to. But we don't either. They, like... Our 70% uh, Del Tombo Ecuador bar is the same here in Chicago as it is in Stockholm. So we don't change it. Hi. I had a question for Odette. Um, I was interested. For Caroline? Oh, I'm sorry. That's the woman okay. from Vosges. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I had a question. I, um, the Chocolate Temple, if you could talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that. I think it's going to be built in Chicago. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. I'd heard about it for a while. I'd be interested in if you could um, just about. expound on it and how we can all get a tour. Sure. Yeah, I'd be thrilled to. It's, it's a huge part of everybody's lives who's involved with Boja Chocolat. Katrina has always had a dream to invite people to have chocolate experiences. She does it through her products. The ultimate is at our stores, and now will be this chocolate temple, which she is building, that will in invite people to the manufacturing facility where she's making all the chocolate. And because she doesn't just make chocolate, as we've been discussing, it's really going to be more of an innovation center. So it's being built in the Logan Square area of Chicago, and it's actually under construction now. We just started. And it will be open to the public by summer of next year. Um, so what you can expect is uh, it's a very thoughtful um, design so that when visitors come, it's sort of an all-you-can-eat, all-you-can-handle chocolate experience, not in a gluttonous way, but she wants to really inspire people and introduce them to everything, and so it's going to be multi-sensory. There is the history of chocolate and a, a bit of an educational aspect, just like you would get at a museum about chocolate and where, you know, cacao is grown and how it grows. Uh, but she also has an innovation area where she wants people to be inspired by her chocolate, whether she uses chocolate as her medium, but she's hoping when people come there, it will help open their minds and help them think about what they're interested in and what may inspire them. And so you get to see how her chocolate is made, learn about her process, and then there's another entire aspect of the experience, which is just about innovation and um, interaction. And as I said, of course, there will be as much chocolate as you can handle. Uh, and you can, if you keep your eye on the website, and we have an email mailing list where we're going to start giving updates and on our Facebook page, and we'll be opening tours to the public in Chicago next summer. I think we have time for a couple more questions. If nobody has one right now, oh, we've got one coming up. <laughs> I think this is a rather pedestrian question, I think, but do you, uh, either of you, recommend any of your products for home bakers to use? And if not, what would you recommend for home bakers? Well, we have, we have our chocolate, much of our chocolate that we sell that you would eat is also available for home bakers. And it's um, on our website. We sell it by the kilo. I use the metric system since I used to defend drug dealers. But... Um, because <laughs> um, I'm not very good at math. And the metric system makes sense to me. I mean, it's... It's easy, but so we sell it by the kilo, um, and so you can buy our cocoa powder, and which home bakers love, and we're, as far as I know, the only people in North America making cocoa powder from scratch. We make it in our factory. It's all natural. It's non-alkalized, and we also sell that on our website um, by the kilo, and also in smaller quantities, but it's great for bakers and home bakers to make all sorts of desserts. And um, we also sell roasted cocoa nibs, so the beans that we buy, we roast them and, and, uh, and sell those in quantities for people to bake with and 
And I'm sure you guys have a lot too. Yeah, we have, um, Katrina has a line actually of baking mixes. So she has a brownie mix and an ultimate chocolate chip cookie mix and a sugar cookie mix. And so there are, if you want to take the easy route, you can buy one of the mixes and create a Vosges baked to good at home. Uh, but also her, we don't have a lot of plain dark chocolate or plain milk chocolate, but I have a lot of fun. I'm a big baker, and I love to experiment with the exotic candy bars in baked goods. And on her website, Katrina shares a lot of recipes, and she also has a blog. So she has brownie recipes where maybe you want to put in one of our chili and chocolate bars to give a little bit of warmth or zing. So if you are a baker with an experimental flair, then I would suggest you try some of the exotic candy bars, especially the dark ones, and you can chop them up and just use them by weight, just like you would chocolate chips. Hi, my name's Josh, and uh, I was just wondering in the uh, development process of new flavors, um, do things always, I assume you start off on a small scale and then scale up once you come upon a flavor you want to produce, does everything always scale up properly, and if not, are there, do you have any good examples of things that tasted good on a small scale and then were a disaster when you went? <laughs> to a larger scale. Not that I'm willing to comment on <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> could you talk a little bit yeah. about the scaling up of one of the newer uh, products oh, that they're well, selling? Yeah, yeah. We, we're experiencing, we do, yeah. Katrina still makes things in her kitchen and she comes in with trays of things and I'm lucky enough to go to her house sometimes and try things she's working on. Um, there are a couple examples, uh, one of them in an older, am I on still, am I on, okay. Um, she did a cheese and chocolate trouble, truffle, and that was very hard as she scaled up because of the emulsification of Taleggio cheese and dark chocolate, which sounds weird, but is fantastic. Um, so that was a problem as she scaled up because of the emulsification of cheese and chocolate. Recently, one of our new candy bars she designed was this uh, crispy carrot bar, and there are crispy carrots and Valencia orange powder. And I was helping with some training, and I called her. I said, what's the story with this new bar? And we're chatting on the phone. And she always acts, it's fun to talk about her. She's not here to hear me do it, but to brag about her. But she always acts like, oh, yeah, no big deal. I just decided that confit carrots would be a really good idea. And, you know, I've always wanted to do confit carrots. So she makes them in her oven, and she lets these really thin carrots get crispy. And so it sort of makes the crunch in the bar instead of a crispy type crunch. And then she wanted a little citric acid, so she wanted Valencia orange powder, and she dehydrated some Valencia oranges, and she pureed them to powder, and it was a great bar. Well, now we give it to the kitchen, and we, have, we sell it to Whole Foods Grocery and other places, and we need a lot of crispy carrot bars. Well, the Valencia orange powder that was sourced from another source was not to her liking, and she wants that Valencia orange powder just right. So what ended up happening was, the, uh, we have a Beverly Hills store that has a chocolate lab and they have a dehydrator and she's got a small dehydrator and we're gonna get one more dehydrator. And so every week there's these two pounds of Valencia orange powder being flown around to try to get to the kitchen in order to make this crispy carrot bar. And it can make people a little crazy, but she is just absolutely adamant about the artisan process. And so the scaling up, I'd say, can be a difficult challenge for those in the production area uh, because she doesn't cut corners. So that can happen, for sure. You still want to share a story of a <laughs> failed scaling up? Uh, well, I mean, when we scaled up in the beginning. I mean, tempering chocolate in my kitchen was one thing, and it took us four months to be able to temper chocolate in our factory, working every day, seven days a week. Um, and I had thought I had bought all the equipment that I needed, and we were having a great deal of difficulty. And um, it was a real problem because uh, I already quit my job and hired people and had equipment and uh, no more clients. And uh, so literally four months. And it was, it was just really a really uh, stressful time to not be able to do that on a larger scale at 200 pounds at a time. And now we can. All right. We've got one minute for one last question. So the... I'm, I'm very excited about the Eskenazi chocolate, and I've been aware of Vosges chocolate for a while. There are a number of other small chocolate producers doing this sort of bean-to-bar kind of structure. I can think of Taza in, in Somerville and uh, Equal Exchange that are two brands that I'm very familiar with. Is there any kind of trade uh, consortium or industry place where, where you guys can get together and talk and, and try to collaborate on making more good in the world and we, more good chocolate? We do. Uh, Craft Chocolate Makers of America, there were four or five of us that founded that organization about four years ago. And now it has more members and we do talk with each other and try to learn from each other and talk about common issues and things that we can do to help each other uh, candidly. Um, the, uh, most of us are very small 
And it seems as though lately in the last couple of years that we have been so focused on just our own work and getting the product out that we haven't been able to collaborate as much as we did even three or four years ago. Um, but the, the sector of that, of that market is really, really growing. And there's a lot more uh, bean-to-bar um, chocolate makers than when I um, started in 2006. And so um, I hope we can continue to work together and work on these issues because it's only going to make it better for all of us as we can um, educate and inform people who want to know about these things. All right. I think our time's come to an end. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.